presentation. Dr. Lucas Bulwan is a software safety expert working with BMW car IT GmbH. Lucas received his PhD in formal methods from Technische Universität München in 2013. Since then, he has been working at BMW on research activities. He is currently engaged in the SIL to Linux MP industrial collaboration project, which wants to answer if and how to use the Linux operating system in critical safety critical systems. Over to you, sir. So, thanks for the introduction. Um, so I'll be talking about um, Linux safety verification. So we're um, interested in finding a suitable process for using Linux and safety critical systems. Um, yes, I'm working at BMW, you would guess it, and we're interested in autonomous driving. But of course, one part of it is looking at the operating system. There we go. Okay, so what's the motivation for it? Um, of course, tech, we're, all, we're all technicians, we're all engineers. We have an engineering challenge there and we want to accept it. But of course, there's a business interest in that. So what we see in, in the moment is that but various industries, even established industries, are, for, um, are seeing software innovations, hitting them and the software innovations actually put them in a position that they have to find out um, will they invest themselves into software innovations or do they give these profits to software vendors? And that's a, a, a main question that's uh, driving the industry um, around. And if you look at Linux and you consider the history of Linux, we'll find out that um, in the software industry in the 80s, there was the so-called Unix wars, uh, various operating systems, all kind of U Unix variants um, that created a vendor um, lock in mess, right? So there were various systems. Um, and once you decided as a user for one system, you could not switch to another one. And as it happened, these users got somehow frustrated through that situation and tried to drive a portable standard, POSIX. And at that same time, um, Linux was born. It was more or less just a student project. But what happened was that due to the open source collaboration model, um, various users and the losers of that Unix war actually formed around it and they built a strong ecosystem. And if you now go more or less 30 years into the future, you'll find out Linux is actually um, the winner of this overall battle. Um, it's used in um, say 500 of 500 supercomputers. It's used in the, um, the largest part of the, in the embedded market. Um, it's used in a large part of the smartphones um, due to Android. And so it's really um, has been become the operating system that you see nowadays. And it is the case that this operating system doesn't belong to anyone, but really um, various companies, face Google, IBM, they're all investing in that operating system, although they don't really sell software, they're actually just selling services around it, selling hardware. But nevertheless, they get interested in investing in software in that, in that respect. So what we see now is that actually the mech mechatronic industry and automotive and robotics industry is actually at the same crossway for safety critical operating systems. Right, when they want to run complex algorithms and complex software. So all these autonomous um, driving, autonomous um, vehicles will be complex software systems and they have, have to have some operating system for that, for that purpose. So the question is, how do we create a healthy ecosystem for those of safety critical oper operating systems so that the companies can actually focus on the software functions that what, what we care about. And that, um, and if you look at um, the different alternative choices that you have, you find out that the Linux operating system has a number of benefits. It's a large development ecosystem. It is probably one of the most secure systems out there. It has multi-core support, unmatched hardware support, and various Linux experts at any levels. So what is it really missing to actually fulfill that uh, to fulfill that gap uh, yeah, or that role. Um, we have two gaps. That's the real-time capabilities and the proven safety compliant development process. The first thing is 
uh, yeah, topic for another talk. Second thing is that what we'll focus on here. And this actually led to a um, industrial research project, the SIL2 Linux MP project. Um, and its mission is to provide procedures and methods to qualify Linux in a multi-core embedded platform at safety and integrity level two, according to ISC 61508. So why safety integrity level two? First of all, because that's feasible. More than that is really difficult. Secondly, um, if you're gonna build a system, you have some system de designed around you and probably it's sufficient to actually use uh, Linux as at the safety integrity level two. So, but we don't only wanna provide procedures and methods, we actually wanna show that that's feasible apply it in a real world system. It's a small, but it's a real world system that we use. And then show that there's potential for collaboration and reuse of those artifacts that we have. So it's a collaborative project, started in 2015. So we're now about three and a half years in, in, the, in this project. Um, we have 15 um, part, industrial partners involved. Um, it's mainly driven by um, BMW and Intel. Uh, we have a number of academic members experts from certification bodies. And last but really most important is the working team. So that's um, four people, Nicholas McGuire, Andreas Placek, Lukas Böhm and uh, Markus Kreidel that are working at OpenTech. So what is the general assumption, right? We wanna answer the question, is using Linux in a safety critical system safe or unsafe? And if you look into that, there's actually say four definitions of, of or yeah, three definitions of safe. The one is it's established with safe. You use follow you follow a common unquestioned interpretation of the safety standard and you show, okay, that's safe. It's clearly Linux is not going to be that way. You look into the standards, you find there are some clauses, some interpretation that everyone follows that you will not um, fulfill. But then you could say, okay, it's not the common interpretation, but um, do I actually meet the objectives of the global safety standard? So that's objectively safe. And you'll find out in many cases you can meet the objectives of the safety standard when you want to go answer that question. But even then, in some cases, you will be in, in, the, uh, in the situation that you say, well, I cannot meet this objective of the safety standard. So what could you then do? You could say, just give up. Or you could say, well, possibly this is not the right objective that has been stated in the safety standard. Um, because of certain assumptions that they, the authors had when they wrote the safety standard. So do we come up with other objectives that actually uh, replace the objectives in the safety standard that are actually sufficient and, also, and nevertheless lead to a safe system? And that's the, the question that we're kind of following. So if you now consider um, answering the question um, using Linux in a safe system, you'll find out that and the system is really safe by a proper composition. So I can, of course, always use Linux in a safe system if I properly compose it in there. Um, so the only thing is remaining is what are the safety capabilities that I can actually argue for Linux and then find the proper balance, how to employ Linux in that system with these uh, assumed capabilities. And then show, of course, the evidence for the uh, capabilities that you that you're assuming. Um, so there are multiple different system architectures that you could look at. Um, here are more or less three of them. Um, the first one is more or less this, what's possibly known as kind of the checker pattern, you check somehow the output afterwards. Um, second architecture is this hypervisor pattern, you use hypervisor to isolate software from each other. And the third architecture, that's the assumption that we have in our in our case, that we say we're using more or less custom hardware. Uh, uh, no. uh, we're using, let's say, commercial off-the-shelf hardware. We're running a Linux kernel on top of it, and we use the isolation mechanisms of the Linux kernel to isolate non-safety critical software from safety critical software. And the safety critical software is running on top of the, the Linux kernel using the mechanisms of the Linux kernel, scheduling, multi-threading, file system, and so on. And that has as a consequence that you actually have to look at parts of the Linux kernel and parts of the hardware um, that you have to verify or qualify. So 
Um, now, if we want to do that, you have to know some basics about, about Linux. Um, Linux is a large software project, and it has an impressive change rate. Um, you'll see the numbers here, 23 mil million lines of code, 2 million lines of uh, documentation. So people say it's not documented. Well, read 2 million lines, right? That's, that's, that's going to be a lot of work. Um, 14,000 commits every 70 days, every release. We have 1,700 uh, 1, developers in each release. Um, the, the kernel developers are affiliated with many different companies or act as individuals. The development process is highly transparent. That's the, the characteristics of open source. Um, and the process is defined. It's actually defined and it's enforced, but it's enforced, enforced by social contract, not by legal working contracts. Uh, makes a difference. Um, once a kernel is released, um, there's a stabilization phase. So if we look at that, and we can see that in the stabilization phase of the 4.9 kernel, which was released more or less uh, one and a half years ago, um, there were 7,360 bug fix commits. So it's actually, you see that 100 bugs are corrected each week on average. And that's not just happening by execution and things crashing, but actually by people reviewing the code, verification activities that are going on uh, in that stabilization phase. So the question is really, how do I get uh, a safety qualification, safety verification for such a piece, right? So we looked into that and we have a number of uh, research results. Unfortunately, I can't go really into all of them. I'll just uh, point out some of them here and then um, pick a few. So uh, the qualification route is kind of the core starting point. You could imagine you go into the IEC 61508 and you see, oh, there's proven by use. So I'll just run it and then I'm done. That's certainly not the way to do it. What we're doing is a um, route 3S that's called a compliant, non-compliant development. Basic idea is I have a process in front of me. It's not compliant by definition because it didn't start with that, but I find out, so it's a non-compliant development, but I find out what are the gaps and I close the gaps afterwards. And then that's, that way I can argue that this is a compliant development. And the uh, safety standard IEC 61508 actually opens the door for that with its uh, definitions and, and clauses. So to do that, you now have to actually say, what's a systematic approach to replace methods? You see some method does not apply to your, or hasn't been applied in your development process. So what is a systematic way of saying, I cannot apply this approach and I will apply another method. So, right, so for that, we developed a systematic approach. Then the other thing is, of course, Linux has not been developed with safety in mind, right? So what you have to do, you have to close that gap and say, if Linux hasn't been developed with, with safety in mind, I have to do my, my system and my safety engineering with much more rigor so that I actually can precisely formulate what are the requirements that I expect from the Linux kernel. So it's a system um, development method. Uh, we have software layer of protection analysis. We have multiple mechanisms that are in the Linux kernel that we can use. And we can actually say they sum up to a proper mechanism protecting you for, for some fault. Um, statistic modeling, I'll tell us something about verification activities. And then of course, as we've seen, we have 100 bugs every week that we have to consider. So how do we do actually the proper maintenance and operations mode, right? If you know that these bugs will be detected uh, in your um, system while it's in the, in the field. Okay, um, so very shortly, just one thing on hazard-driven um, decomposition design and development. The goal is really to find um, precise technical safety requirements on the operating system. So what we did in the very beginning, very naively was, okay, what's your requirement? And then people come back and say, well, the system called open is used in a safety, safety critical application and must work correctly. And with that kind of requirement, it's, it's correct, but it's way too imprecise to actually guide any further testing, verification, and validation activities. You're not gonna get um, 
not going to get to a useful uh, verification activity if you kind of start with that requirement. So what we did is we started all over the the system design and we said, okay, you really have to be more precise um, and we have a method for that. That resulted then in constraints on that syscall that actually now make it possible to um, specifically test and verify um, that this works properly. So what's the, the basic idea? The basic idea is that you actually repeat um, a hazard analysis on various levels of your architectural design. Um, and that gives you a much more precise requirement on the lower levels and then makes the verification activities uh, possible. Can't tell you much more about that, um, but yeah, uh, possibly uh, we can discuss that later. Um, one other point that I want to point out is statistic modeling. Um, the idea is if you have a known process and you have a known um, organization, um, you know that this will lead to a safe system. Um, and what happens when you have a safe system is that you would assume that the defects um, over time and the development kind of go in an expo exponentially lowering curve, roughly, right? Um, over time, things will just get better. Now, if you have the Linux kernel development process, we can also argue that all these activities are happening, but it doesn't tell you anything because you don't know if the organizational constraints are given, right? It's not a company, it's various people that are just by social contract agreeing to do something. So who knows if that is actually um, um, effective in that what they are doing. And you could say, well, I obviously cannot fulfill all of the organizational constraints. So we have to get around that. So how do we do that? We actually say, we can see that these activities are happening and we look at the outcome output of that kind of process happening. So we look at what are the possible, what are the defects over time and how do they behave? And then we can say, well, if it seems to be this kind of degrading curve, this process must be effective just as other processes and companies. Yeah, so that's really a, let's say, very, uh, that's just, we're using statistic methods to argue that um, the, 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 methods that are the verification methods that are applied are, are effective and i'm one of the people that is highly challenging this controversial condition but nevertheless i have to respect that in other domains statistic is is often used to prove facts empirically but we don't do that in software development processes yet right but what we can actually see is that this curve goes down and there must be some kind of interpretation that explains that um, Again, that's um, under heavy discussion um, among the experts in, in that group um, that we're trying to find out, is that actually an evidence or is that just a coincidence? Yeah, so um, of course you have to do certain quality assurance activities. There's actually a lot of that in the Linux kernel already in place. Um, and there's also a lot of verification tools that are specifically for the Linux kernel. Can't na name them all. Um, but there's various things around that. The core point, point for a Linux safety verification project is that you actually argue that against the uh, objectives of the safety standard. Okay, so um, what we have been doing um, is really at the moment, we after three years, we're at the point we have processes, methods, and qualification route. We have this use case and system decomposition we have the hardware safety requirements, the Linux safety, the software safety requirements, and we're right now facing the challenge of finding the suitable hardware. What's the suitable hardware to continue this use case? And from then on, we can somehow go through the usual cycle until we have a final assessment of that system. Yes, um, so um, really to conclude, if you want to know more about uh, this project, um, um, contact me or contact Nicholas McGuire. Um, um, we have a SO2 Linux MP safety critical working group that's uh, interested in this work. If you want to learn more, we'll have a full day, day workshop in October at the uh, Embedded Linux Conference Europe in Edinburgh. 
And all those uh, things that I just presented are really just at the moment um, under review of the participating companies. And I assume that they'll be soon published in a couple of months. So using Linux is a feasible activity. We haven't seen any showstoppers in the in this research project, but of course, to actually do this, we have to to learn a lot, learn uh, understand a lot, and actually then really do a lot. Um, that is what what is the future? Yes. Thanks for your time. Thanks, sir. I think we have a question here. Is this a closed project, or any company can take part in the collaboration? So it's similar as Linux. It's a, it's an open project. Any company can participate, um, and you can really participate either by funding or you can participate by uh, technical contribution. Any more questions? Stuart Jobbins from Sofinsys. Um, for a long time, BMW especially has been involved in the Autosar project to make platform independent uh, applications. Um, and and how, how does this then fit? Because obviously Linux is platform specific. Um, no, so, um, if you follow Autosar, you know that there's Autosar, you know that there's Adaptive Autosar. I've been in that uh, committee as well. Um, and the idea is that we define towards the application uh, um, an agnostic uh, interface. So that's that's fine. But of course, then you still have to look into the architecture of how to build such a platform. And then you'll find out you choose the operating system. Um, choosing Linux is not, let's say, uh, choosing one specific one. Again, it's, it's a POSIX, com it's POSIX compatible. So again, you could actually run any application on on top that you could use on the other operating systems as well. Um, yeah. yeah. You mentioned uh, real-time issues and that's an, another presentation. I just wondered, has this group actually done anything on real-time Linux? Not this project has been doing anything on that, but there's um, another project, a real-time Linux project from the Linux Foundation um, headed by Thomas Gleixner, and yes, they're working on that. I'm financing that as well. So. Hey, Chris, Chris Chaplin from uh, Intel. I'm just wondering with the, the safety critical Linux, do you see that as kind of being a branch of Linux, or do you see that being mainline, and do you see specific versions being something that we define as safety critical or do you see it as something that's ongoing and just part of Linux as it, as it develops forwards? So um, I think the main insight is you're not going to achieve a safe safe system by using something that everyone uses and then modifying it because you think it's becoming better because of that. So it's clearly, um, I didn't point this out in the slides, but it's clear that um, when you want to say this is used in a safety critical system, you're advised to all the things that you find in your verification activities to play them back into the community. Again, you might be just using a tool, you might be using one expert that you know, but of course the whole community is in its, let's say, intelligence much higher than what you would do with a tool, what you would do with one expert. So the idea is you bring it back into the development process and then it will be challenged and if it is accepted, you can actually say it's of much higher quality than rather having it somehow out of the tree. So it is safety critical Linux is not a special product. It is the mainline kernel, but you use it in a certain way, you use a certain process um, to actually show that you follow the safety standard. You don't modify the artifact, you modify the way you use it and the activities you do to show that the way you use it fits to the to to how it has been developed. I, think. I guess we are running out of running out of time again. Uh, please ask your questions. This this will be the last question then. Yeah. It was it was just kind of a follow up on what you were just talking about. Uh, do you get any kickback from the Linux community about integrating integrating these patches? So I know sometimes when they do some of the security patches. Uh, they get kind of knocked back because they affect the usability. 
um, uh, yeah, to get kicked out? Um, so what we're looking at is, or the patches that we produce are due to verification activities. There we usually do not get, let's say, large kickback. Of course, you do get kickback when you say uh, you have to, f so you define this this coding style and we want to improve that coding style. And then you get this kickback of, yeah, you know what you're doing here. Um, uh, we don't want to have a non-expert just modifying code because of kind of syntactic criteria. And I think that's a valid kickback, even though possibly the IEC and the ISO 262 say, well, you have to have a coding standard and you have to follow that uh, perfectly well, right? That's just um, the common understanding of this is a suggestion, a recommendation for, versus the Linux kernel follows on uh, policies to improve the software quality and that might sometimes contradict each other. Yeah. But usually that's not the case. Thanks everyone. I think this concludes the safety session. Thanks. Thank you.